my subject for today's discussion with you is a very brief review of signals and systems because I believe there are some of you who might have slightly lost touch with the subject because there is a gap of about a semester or a year for, for them, right. So I just want everybody to be uh, on equal terms here and uh, this is important for all of you that you have a very good solid background in signals and systems as I mentioned earlier also in the discussions. Now um, before I do that let me complete uh, the discussion we were having last time about communication channels. <coughs> if you remember I discussed a variety of uh, communication channels with you particularly channels which, uh, which are relevant to us namely electrical communication channels by um, practically every one of these channels is some kind of an electromagnetic wave channel. It could be a free space propagation channel uh, like we have in the atmosphere or in free space or it could be a guided electromagnetic wave channel, right. The examples of guided electromagnetic wave channels are the pair of wires through which you may communicate let us say as you do from your home to a telephone exchange or a cable, coaxial cable. Uh, which can carry much larger number of signals than a pair of wires can because of the larger bandwidth it can it can support or it could be an optical fiber right uh, which can support an even larger bandwidth and here there is a small comment I, I would like you to make I would like to make and ask all of you to think about it typically as you go up in the carrier frequency or center frequency of operation in a communication channel if you are able to do so it increases your ability to take up larger bandwidth. It gives you, it supports a larger bandwidth, right. Why is it so? Think about it and we will discuss it sometime, <coughs> all right. For example, why do we use optical communications? Why do we use fiber optic communications? Because it has the capacity to offer you much larger bandwidth than let us say microwave communications can do or even a larger than a coaxial cable uh, can support and so on and so forth. So it is an issue which I like you to think about before I respond to this. Now come back, let us come back to our subject of interest today which is a very brief overview of signals and systems. Now uh, um, to start with, let me start at the very beginning and if you remember uh, you must have dealt with a representation of signals in terms of uh, um, uh, you know first starting with the most basic signals. Well to start with if you remember we can uh, classify signals into two kinds namely deterministic and random signals. So we are talking about signals right now. And in communications we deal with both kinds of signals because deterministic signals are useful to us as for example as carriers, right. We use a sine wave as a carrier of a certain frequency, right. And deterministic signals are also useful in, 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 in generating synthetic signals of various kinds. But random signals are absolutely uh, characteristic of communications, why? Because most of the time the information that you are of, that is of interest to you is typically unpredictable in its form right? and therefore it is random. Even the speech waveform that is coming out of a person's speech voice is an unpredictable waveform to, to a large extent, right? to some extent it is predictable but to a large extent it is quite unpredictable and therefore it is quite random. Similarly the noise that you encounter in a communication system can only be modeled as a uh, random signal. Now right now I will not review the random signals part, I would only look at the deterministic signals. The most basic kind of deterministic signals which you come across are complex exponentials and sinusoidal signals, real sinusoidal signals, right. So if you take a real sinusoid like a very simple signal like this, right. We know some of its features but as you must have already learnt that you can express a real sinusoid or cosinusoid in terms of 
complex exponentials and it is much easier to work with complex exponentials in many instances than with the corresponding trigonometric function. Okay. Um, so, in fact, the complex exponential you can think of as a, as, as a rotating phasor and the cosine signal can be thought of as a resultant of two rotating phasors which are moving in opposite directions, one in, a, in clockwise direction and the other in anti-clockwise direction. So, you can think of this as real part of let us say this complex exponential. Now, this is very basic stuff, but it is useful to review this because sometimes people forget the basic stuff and uh, they have difficulties later. So, this is the let us say the a phasor which is rotating in the clockwise direction, if it is in the clockwise then the, this is the sum of these two phases. The other one rotating in the anti-clockwise anti direction as indicated by this negative sign in the exponent. Similarly, if you have uh, let us say a signal like this, this is just an example. Right. You can express it if you were to carry out some uh, simple trigonometric manipulations as e to the power j 10 pi t minus 2 pi by 3 plus e to the power minus j 10 pi t minus 2 pi by 3. So, whether you are working with a cosine wave or a sine wave you can think of it as sum of phasors and phasor is a complex exponential rotating either clockwise or anticlockwise right? and this term in the phasor indicates the phase initial phase of the phasor. Do you have any questions? Have I made any mistake? Minus and the minus. Yes, correct. And the the I. I. That's right. I think this is okay. This okay. Actually, I am sorry, this is correct. There is a mistake. Please, please check it out. Please check it out. What I have written is absolutely correct. Yes, sir. You have confused me. Right? You have, because, uh, you have to first, the way I have gone, we already discussed express sign in terms of cosine and then written it in those terms. Right? Please check it out. This is just an example. I do make mistakes at times and I like you to correct me when I do make mistakes. But if I do not make mistakes, do not make me make mistakes. <laughs> okay? It is alright. Now, uh, now, as I said, the sinusoids are some of the most basic kinds of signals in terms of which you uh, work. Why do we consider them as basic? First, because they are very easy to generate. Right? For example, a typical oscillator that you might have used in your lab or you might have learnt about in your uh, analog electronic circuits are likely to learn soon, naturally generates a sine wave, right? Oscillations are in the form of sinusoidal oscillations. That is one reason. The other reason is many other deterministic signals can be represented in terms of sine waves. For example, that is what Fourier series is all about which I will review in a few minutes, right? Now, just like sine waves, there is another, there's another set of basic signals which are quite different in nature. Sine waves are um, infinite duration signals extending from minus infinity to plus infinity. They are periodic signals. Right? As against this, you can have a very different variety of basic signals which are very useful in the concepts and signals and signals and some communications, signals and systems. And one of those basic kind of signals is the impulse function. I am sure all of you know very well about it and let us quickly review what is the definition. There are two ways of defining the impulse function. 
well, several ways, not just two ways, there are several ways. The, because since this is a review, I will not go into a very detailed description of all those uh, various methods. All we say is that an impulse located at t equal to 0 is denoted by delta t and is defined to be a function which encloses a unit area under it and it is 0 everywhere other than t equal to 0. So this is a definition of an impulse function. Right? This is one definition of a number of possible definitions of an impulse function. Right? So some people sometimes write by mistake delta of t equal to 1 at t equal to 0. Huh? That is wrong. Right? Delta of t at t equal to 0 is undefined, is actually infinity. Right? But the area under it is well defined. And to indicate that fact, the usual notation for an impulse function is something like this. This is the time axis. Suppose the impulse is located at t naught, then you will write this as. So this is your time origin. This will be the impulse located at t minus. And this arrow here indicates that the amplitude of the impulse is infinity or undefined. Right? And but the area under it is one. So if it is k times delta t minus t naught, everything remains the same except that we say that the area of the impulse is area under the impulse is now k, or the strength of the impulse is k. Right? That's the usual language that is used. Now some of the very important properties of an impulse function are if you have a time function, so if, uh, if you, I will just quickly review the basic concepts and discuss the basic properties. I will not discuss any proofs here because the idea is to make you recollect these things more than anything else. Right? Well, uh, if, if, you, if you don't understand something of this, I would suggest that that's, that's what you should look for when you are reviewing your signals and systems. Let us quickly go through the proofs and things like that. So if you look at this integral of x t multiplied with delta t minus t naught minus infinity to infinity dt, what is the value? x t naught, right? Very important property, also called the sifting property of an impulse function. Right. Now, uh, sometimes this is also taken as a definition of impulse function. Right. So it's a matter of uh, starting from here and proving this, or the other way around. Some of the other properties are: if you look at, if you scale the time axis by a then delta of at would be 1 by mod a of delta t and so on and so forth. One, the last property that I would like to discuss is suppose I consider this, just the product of x t into delta t minus t naught. We can also write this as x t naught into delta my t minus t naught. All right. Now, another basic signal which is very closely related to the impulse function signal is the unit step function. Pictorially, the unit step function is a function like this. Its value is 1 for t greater than 0, so that is a definition. And 0 for t less than 0. Or it can also be defined in terms of an integral with respect to the impulse function. Integration will be from minus infinity to t. As you can see, this will be equal to this, right? So that's as far as basic signals go. 
One set of basic signals are your complex explanations, trigonometric sinusoids of various frequencies. Then you have the impulse function and the unit step function. And there are several functions which one can derive from these basic functions. We quickly now look at Fourier series because I am trying to um, collect technically all the important concepts of interest to us in this course into this lecture, right. So, we will quickly review all of these things, okay. Before we talk about Fourier series, you remember that Fourier series are defined for periodic signals. So, we have to talk about periodic signals. We say that a signal is periodic with period T naught if x of t plus t naught is equal to x of t for all values of t and for all values of t and for a given t naught. Now, if it is periodic, then we can represent the signal x of t in terms of exponentials of period 2 pi by omega naught and its uh, well, its multiples. Actually, frequency is omega naught and its multiples, right? So we can represent it in terms of some coefficients x of n e to the power j 2 pi omega 0 t where omega 0 is 2 pi by is there a mistake here? It should be 2 pi n omega 0 t right n going from I am sorry, it should be either f 2 pi f naught t or um, n omega naught t, right. So, let me change that to 2 pi n f naught t, where f naught is 1 by 2 pi of omega naught. And this representation is valid over a period. Or so, if you take any period between T0 to T0 plus capital T sub 0, T sub 0 to cap, T sub 0 to plus capital T sub 0, this representation is valid. It is valid for any period of the function x of t. The coefficients xn in this Fourier series are given by integral of x t e to the power minus j n omega naught t. This is what you wanted to tell me to write, right? Yeah. Oh, so, this should be uh, let us say t 0 to t 0 plus t capital T 0, right? And these coefficients we call the Fourier coefficients. the signal x of t, right. So, here we have a representation of the periodic signal x of t in terms of a set of infinite, an infinite set of coefficients and going from minus infinity to plus infinity. This is a so called complex form of the Fourier series. You, you also have real forms which use trigonometric functions cosine omega, cosine n omega dot t and sin n omega right. So, these Fourier coefficients represent the signal in what we call the frequency domain, right. You can say x of n is a coefficient which has an amplitude which you can call mod of x of n and which has some phase which you can call as the angle of x of n or call it theta n if you like, right. This, this amplitude and this phase information represents the amplitude and phase of the nth component in the Fourier series. The nth component being e to the power j n omega naught t. Right? Now, and therefore, we call this as the amplitude spectrum of the signal. When we plot x of n against n, n is an integer here. 
going from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, if I plot x of n against n, right, it will be a discrete plot, it will, the plot will be in the form of lines, it will be a line spectrum in this case, right. So, if I plot mod of x of n against n, that gives me the amplitude spectrum of the signal. If I plot theta of n against n, that gives me the phase spectrum of the signal. Now, for real signal x of t, so I am looking at some properties of the Fourier series now. For real x t, what can you say about x of n? In particular, if I ask you the relationship between x of n mod and x of n, x, x of min, x sub minus n of mod, what will be the relationship? They are equal, right. Similarly, if you look at the angle of x of n and the angle of x of minus n, what is the relationship? They are negative of each other, right. We say that the amplitude spectrum is an even symmetric function and the phase spectrum is a not symmetric function not for all kinds of signals but only for real signals, real valued signals, right. This can be neatly summarized in the form of a single equation saying that x of n conjugate is equal to x of minus n for real signals. The second most, there are many properties of Fourier series, but since they are very similar to the properties of the Fourier transform which I am coming to shortly, I will not discuss all of them, they are very, they are parallel to each other, right. So, if you know some of the properties of the Fourier transform, you also know the correspond, corresponding properties of the Fourier series, right. But one property which I like to discuss here very briefly is the Parsevals theorem. Do you remember that? It is a very important result because it uh, relates the energy calculation of the signal in the time domain, energy or power. In this case, should you, should you talk about power or energy? It will depend on what kind of signal we are dealing with, power signal or energy signal. A power signal is one in which it makes more sense to calculate power because it has a finite power, right. For example, a sinusoid has infinite duration. What is its energy? Infinity, right. So, it does not have a finite power, it does not make sense to, uh, does it does not have finite energy. So, we do not call it an energy signal, we call it a power signal. So, on the other hand, a signal which is a, uh, which has a finite energy typically will have zero power, right, because power is defined in terms of um, energy divided by time as time tends to infinity, time interval tends to infinity. So, if the energy is finite and time interval tends to infinity, the average power would be 0. So, it makes more sense there to talk about energy rather than power, right. So, for sinusoids, for periodic signals in general, they have to be necessarily of infinite duration. A strictly periodic signal has to be of infinite duration and therefore, it is better described in terms of power than in terms of energy. So, here we talk about power therefore, which is the power calculation here would be to look at the integral of x t mod square d t over any period t 0, right. That is the average power and divided by t 0. This by Parsevals theorem can be obtained by simply summing the magnitude squares of all the Fourier coefficients. Very interesting result, right. If you sum the magnitude square of all the Fourier coefficients, that gives you the average power of the signal. So, now we quickly come to Fourier transforms. Unlike the Fourier series, which is defined only for periodic signals, Fourier transforms are defined for any signal, uh, strictly speaking the periodic signals, but through some 
uh, flower mechanism it can also be made to represent periodic signals by particularly by the use of impulse functions in the frequency domain you must will be remembering that. So if you have a signal x of t which is no, no longer necessarily periodic then I can define its Fourier transform x of f as integral of x t e d power minus j 2 pi f t d t. Right. If you look at this, it is very, this integral is very closely related to the expression we have for x of n. Right. In fact, you can derive this expression through a limiting procedure on the Fourier coefficients. Right. Where, what is the limiting procedure like? Do you remember? You make the period, first start with a finite period with a periodic signal and then you make the period infinity. Right and you get to the Fourier transform <coughs> and the important thing is the line spectrum of the original periodic signal now becomes a continuous spectrum, right? continuous in the frequency domain. So x of f is a frequency domain description of x of t and one can reconstruct x of t from x of f by taking what is called the inverse Fourier transform. which will be uh, x of t, x of f e to the power plus j 2 pi f t df. Right? If you write it in terms of omega and d omega, then we have to put a 1 by 2 pi, not otherwise. Right? So once again, x of f is called the amplitude spectrum. and the angle of x of f as a function of frequency is the phase spectrum of the signal. Right? So you could write x of f, let us if I call this theta of f, then x of f can be thought of as mod of x of f e d power j theta f right now there are certain conditions which the signal x of t must be must satisfy in order that the Fourier transform exists right I will simply name the conditions these are called the Dirichlet conditions there are three of them in number the most important of these three conditions is the requirement that the signal be of finite energy right that is it is square integrable it should be a magnitude square integrable signal function right right so please review these conditions yourself now a quick review of the properties the most important properties of the Fourier transform Some of the properties are the same that we already discussed in the context of uh, Fourier series. So for a real signal x of t x conjugate f would be equal to x of minus f which is again equivalent to saying that the magnitude spectrum is even symmetric and the phase spectrum is an odd symmetric function of the frequency for real valued signals x of t. Right? So, I need not spend too much more time on that. Similarly, the so called Parsevals theorem, which incidentally is sometimes also called the Rayleigh's energy theorem, is also valid here. So, the equivalent of the Parsevals theorem here would be that if you look at, now it makes more sense to talk about energy here because, in fact, the Fourier transform, the existence of the Fourier transform is only for finite energy signals although we can extend this definition to periodic signals as a special case but generally Fourier transforms are defined only for energy signals because that is a condition we discussed right they should be square integrable right so it takes, makes, makes more sense to talk about energy here so energy means I will simply integrate mod xt square between minus infinity plus infinity this is the same as integral of if you look at the frequency function 
that is a spectrum. Sometimes X of f is simply called the spectrum of the signal, and spectrum has an amplitude part and a phase part. Right? So if you take the amplitude part of that and square that, integrate that over the entire frequency range, these two integrals are same. That is, you can calculate the energy either by a time domain operation like this or by a frequency domain operation like this, whichever is convenient. Right? Now let us look at a few other important results of Fourier series. These are the same of Fourier transforms. These are the same as we discussed for the Fourier series. Please stop me or if you have any questions, uh, please point it out or if you, you find there is a mistake. Uh, the next important result I would like to mention without proof like all other results is the so called convolution theorem. Now I have not yet discussed the concept of convolution which I will discuss separately when I discuss linear time invariant system shortly. But basically assuming that all of you know what is convolution then the result is like this. If you have, okay let me briefly review what is convolution. If you have two signals x1 t and x2 t then I say that x1 t star x2 t is a convolution of x t where this operation is defined in terms of this integral. Right? This integral represents a convolution operation. And then convolution theorem says that the convolution of x1 t and x2 t, <coughs> if x1 t has a Fourier transform of x1 f, x2 t has a Fourier transform of x2 f, then x1 t convolved with x2 t have a Fourier transform which is the product of these two corresponding Fourier transforms. Right? This notation uh, will be used to indicate that these quantities in the left hand side and the right hand side are Fourier transform pairs. Right? This is a very, very important result as we will discuss uh, shortly in the context of linear time invariant systems. Then we have the standard linearity properties and the, and the time delay properties which are uh, skip. Linearity means the Fourier transform is a linear operation, right. That means if I take a linear combination of two signals, the Fourier transform would be linear combination of the corresponding Fourier transforms of the two signals. And the time delay property of course, let me okay, just briefly mention that if x of t and x of f are Fourier transforms, then x of t minus t naught will have a Fourier transform which is x of f e to the power minus j to pi f t naught. Okay. That is the time delay property. Scale change is another important property which says that if I modify the time scale time axis by a scaling factor of a, it will modify the frequency axis in the opposite direction. For example, if a is greater than 1, then the frequency axis will be scaled by 1 by a which will be less than 1 and so on and so forth. So more precise to the result is this is a intuitively very interesting result. Basically what it says is that if you have essentially it implies that if, if you have a signal which is uh, of small duration in the time uh, in the time domain, it will have a large span in the frequency domain. Right? If you compress this time axis, it expands the frequency axis, right? and vice versa. Right? So it has uh, it's a very interesting result, and it also leads to a very interesting concept, which I'll, if time permits, discuss later, and that is the so-called uncertainty relation in communication theory. Have you heard of that? Hmm? Like you have, I am sure you heard of the uncertainty relation in quantum mechanics, there is a corresponding uncertainty relation of communication theory which says that you cannot locate a signal precisely in time as well as in frequency together <coughs> arbitrarily. There is a limit to either you can locate it very accurately in time 
are very accurately in frequency, but not both. Right? Think about it, and we'll discuss it sometime. And this is the consequence of this property of the Fourier transform uh, pairs. Another interesting property is that of duality. I'm doing a very quick review because you have gone through a course in signals and systems, and this is just meant to brush you up on this matter. So duality is interesting. If you construct a time signal, which is which has a shape of the Fourier transform of the signal, right? Of course, this will imply that x of uh, x is a may be a complex valued signal. Right? If you consider a time signal which has a shape of the Fourier transform of small of a, small x of t, then the Fourier transform of this would be small x, the original time domain signal, with f replaced with, uh, with t replaced with minus f. Right? So this is the duality result. The next we come to a very important uh, uh, result, a property of the Fourier transforms called the frequency translation theorem and this theorem is particularly uh, useful uh, in our course when we particularly when we discuss the uh, modulation techniques. Um, this theorem states that if I multiply a time domain signal x of t with a complex exponential e to the power j 2 pi f naught t, then its Fourier transform gets translated to the frequency f naught. That means multiplication of x of t with a complex exponential of frequency f naught shifts the spectrum of x of t or the Fourier transform of x of t to this center to f naught as a center frequency. So it's centric. It's suppose the original signal is centered. The spectrum is centered to zero frequency. After this multiplication, its spectrum gets centered to the frequency f sub zero. This is also similar to what is also called the modulation theorem, in which you multiply x of t with a real cosine side, like cosine two pi f naught t. And now, since this is equal to the sum of e to the power j to pi of naught t and e to the power minus j to pi of naught t, this gets shifted, the spectrum of f x t gets shifted to both f naught as well as to the frequency minus f naught. In other words, pictorially speaking, if this denotes the spectrum of x t which is centered at 0, multiplication of x of t with this leads to a spectrum like this. Whereas multiplication of x of t with sine wave or cosine wave leads to a spectrum like this. That is, this gets shifted to both f naught as well as to minus f naught. This, these theorems play a very crucial role in modulation techniques that we are going to discuss in this course. Uh, in fact, it forms a basis of the most important, one of the most important functions of the transmitter, namely to modify the center frequency of the signal. This is also very useful in receivers uh, when we want to bring a signal from an RF frequency down to a baseband frequency. The next result, uh, which is uh, important to some extent, is the differentiation theorem and correspondingly the integration theorem. I will just state the result without proofs. If you 
take the nth derivative of the signal x of t with respect to time and the corresponding Fourier transform is a product of the Fourier transform of x of t with a factor which is equal to j2 pi f to the power n. Similarly, uh, the reverse result holds when you integrate a signal x of t from minus infinity to t. The Fourier transform now is given by this plus there is a component which is proportional to the DC value of the signal. Uh, there is a scaling factor here which you may check out from the book. This in a nutshell is the Fourier transform. Uh, we have looked at some of the most important properties of the Fourier transform. These, this uh, treatment is not exhaustive and it will be very much appreciated if you were to uh, review the entire set of properties of the Fourier transform on your own. I next move on to systems. A system is a model for some physical system or some process. So when you do a system modeling, a system for example could be a circuit, could be an electrical circuit, it could be a mechanical device. It could be a weather system. It could be anything. The way we will look at a system in this treatment is that it is it has an input and it has an output. And when we talk about system modeling, primarily we are looking at trying to understand the relationship between the output and the input of a system. So when we st study the input-output relationship of a system, uh, we call this system modeling. In, from the system modeling point of view, it is this relationship which is important more than anything else. We look at the system in fact as a black box. It does not matter what it, what it is internally comprised of. It will be comprised of uh, electrical devices, electrical components like resistors, inductors and capacitors. It could be mechanical components like uh, springs and dampeners and whatever uh, things you may have in a mechanical system, etc. What we like to understand is how we understand the response of a system, of a system in relation to some excitations that may be given to it. Now from this point of view, it is convenient to think of the system as an operator. The operator H here operates on X of T, the input signal X of T to produce an output Y of T. Under certain conditions, the operator H is set to be set to correspond to a linear time invariant system. And these are the kind of systems which will be of greatest interest to us. It does not imply of course that communication engineers do not deal with systems which are not linear or which are not time invariant. However, uh, a large part of our treatment will be devoted to uh, handling systems which are LTI systems so, so to say and therefore it is useful to review what LTI systems are all about. We say that the system is linear if the superposition principle holds. In other words, so linearity implies that if the system responds to a signal x1t to produce an output y1t, responds to the signal x2t to produce an output y2t, then if I excite the system with a linear combination of these two signal, these two inputs, namely alpha 1 x1t plus alpha 2 x2t, then the system will respond by producing an output which is a corresponding linear combination of 
y1 and y2. And the time invariance, in addition, the system should uh, satisfy the homogeneity property. That means uh, if I in give a zero input to the system, the output is zero. And by time invariance, we mean that the system response is independent of the time of excitation of the input signal. So if I if the xt produces an output from the system which is y of t and if I delay the input by t naught seconds, the response does not change in nature. All ha that happens is that the response is correspondingly delayed. In other words, until the input comes, the system does not respond or the system responds only by uh, corresponding delay in the input or in the output. Now, from the point of view of describing input output relationships, it is important to understand or important to develop some kind of a characterization of the LTA system. It so happens, uh, it is very easy to check out that for an LTA system, this characterization is very easy and can be done by the response of the system to an impulse. This response usually denoted by H of t is called the impulse response of the system. The significance of the impulse response of the system is that in view of the linearity of the LTA system and in view of the fact that any signal x of t can be expressed as a superimposition of suitably scaled and suitably uh, time displaced impulse functions, it is possible to express the output yt of the signal in terms of a linear combination of the response to these impulses. And this is best expressed in terms of the convolution relation that exists between the input and the output which is given by this. That is given the input x of t and the impulse response h t of the system, the output can be expressed through this superposition formula which is also called the convolution integral which is a manifestation of the superposition property arising from the linearity of the system. And usually expressed in terms of shorter notation like xt convolved with ht. So this is a notation for convolution or it is con the convolution operator. Finally, we just note uh, two important uh, two other important attributes of an LTA system, one relates to causality. We say that a system is causal if this is of course not the definition of causality but it is a test for causality if the system impulse response h t is equal to 0 for t less than 0. This is a um, test for causality. Definition of causality is that the system responds to um, an input x of t. Uh, in other, we can put it like this: um, until there is an input, there is no output. Right? So, since the impulse, is in, impulse response corresponds to an impulse occurring at t equal to zero, there can be no output in the system no non-zero output of the system before time t equals to 0 and hence the impulse response has to be 0 for t less than 0. Another attribute of a system which we shall assume throughout our course to be valid for the system that we study is stability. And stability uh, uh, refers to 
the bounded input bounded output property of the system that is if your input xt is always guaranteed to be less than certain finite value then the output y of t will also be guaranteed to be less than some constant value k and if this is so we say the system is if every such input the output satisfies this property we say that the system is stable and a test for stability is that the integral of the modulus of the impulse response should be bounded, should be less than infinity. So I think with this I will uh, finish the review for our signals and systems and uh, next time we will consider a very important new um, uh, result for you and namely uh, int introduce the concept of the Hilbert transform which we will find is extremely useful for studying um, signals of certain types which we encounter in communication engineering. Thank you.